It's good to see this number here this morning. Those who are visiting with us, we're very happy that you're with us this morning. I want us to take a, a plane ride some 30,000 feet above our Bible and get an overall view, which we've been looking at in the last uh, Lord's Day lessons, but uh, continuing this morning in a special way where we're realizing how can I reverence God and his authority? He said, well, why have authority? Well, he's our creator. He has a right over us. We've been made in his image. And so we recognize from the very beginning, we have a creator and realize if I do, and we do, I, I need to reverence his authority. And what has he done to help us do that? He's given us the Bible. It is inspired of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, Paul tells Timothy, 2, Peter, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. So here comes the Bible. You can have it in the pew. You can have it in your possession. It's probably in English. So you can read it and understand it. Some may have theirs in Spanish because they know that language. But man has been able to receive it. And now we're way above this Bible we have in our hands, and I want us to look at something about what it says that we are looking at and we should reverence, that we should take in mind, this is how I need to approach this Bible. I'm not going to add to it, and I'm not going to take away from it. Well, that's, that's nice, but where do you get that idea? I get it from his word. We go to the end of our Bibles in the New Testament, in Revelation 22, and he said, those that hear the words of this prophecy, which is emphasizing the book of Revelation, but it applies all of Scripture, but especially this moment, at that revelation, the prophecy in there, those who hear that, if they add to it, God will add to them the plagues that are in this book. You'll read about them in Revelation. So if I add to these, this prophecy, I'm going to add my, my problems, my pain. And if I take away from it, God will take away my opportunity for the tree of life, and I won't be able to enjoy that. That's how he ends his Bible. That's how he ends the scripture. And so we're up high, we're looking at it, and I'm, I'm going to get closer to it, and I realize I cannot add to or take away, and that's just not something at the end of the New Testament. It's also in the law of Moses. When God set the law to his people, and now Revelation is to his people, the comprise of Jew and Gentile, when it was just to the Jews, he said, don't you add to this word or diminish from it, so don't take away so that you may keep the commandments of God. That's a positive statement, isn't it? Don't add to it, don't diminish from it, because I want to complicate your life. No. When you don't add to it and you don't take away, you're doing it. And so you can obey the commandments of God, because that's what reverence to God is all about. He's got authority, and this is how he wanted the Old Testament people to live. But that principle carries over into the New Testament, doesn't it? Even to the end. And so if you're visiting this morning and you haven't taken seriously the Bible and you say, well, I, I, I like it, I appreciate it, I, it has its place. But you're here this morning, just fly with me a little bit. And we look down and realize I can't, when I get serious about my Bible, I can't add to it and I can't take away so I can just abide in it. Yeah, abide in it. God emphasizes that too. In 2 John 9, if we go onward and abide not in the teaching of Christ, we don't have God. We don't have his son. And yet the theme of the Bible is God telling us that we can have salvation in his son. And I don't have either one of them. When I do what? When I take the word that he's revealed and I go beyond that. You ever heard of progressivism? We are progressive. That's not, that's not a good trait among Christians. We can progress growing in the faith, but we don't leave the faith. We don't add to it. We don't take away. We abide in that doctrine. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. In Timothy, they were examples 
that they could follow. And in us, you learn not to go beyond the things that are written. Don't be go beyond the things that are written. Now listen to why, why he did that. He didn't do that because you won't have God and you won't have Christ. That's true. But do you want to have unity among God's brethren? That passage in 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is that the reason we don't add to what God has written, we will abide in that which is written because we have one source of authority is God. And what happens when we are going to go beyond it, we got man's opinions, we got man's ideas, and we don't like your idea and, I, and you don't like mine and we will have division. So it is a prescription from God Almighty how we can have unity. He said, well, I got that Bible. Everybody believes differently. That, that's not God's fault. It's us as we fly over. Us. You know, if I'm going to get serious about this Bible, I'm going to realize I'm not going to go beyond the things that are written. And when somebody's preaching things that they not written, I'm going to say, I'm going to be a little as a, dubious about that person. That's East Texas talk for dubious. But we don't go beyond it. We're just flying. We're just looking down. And we begin to see that from outset, Old Testament and New Testament. And then we learn in the scriptures, don't presume things by my silence. We don't become presumptuous of God's silence. And we see that demonstrated in Hebrews, the seventh chapter in verse 14, that in, indeed, Jesus came from a tribe, which is Judah, that God spoke nothing. Silence. He spoke nothing about the tribe of Judah regarding the priesthood. Well, he said Levi, but he said there, he spoke nothing about it. Well, that, that's Okay. Not until you change the word. Because what we read in verse 12, by necessity, there's a change of the law. Because the law stated it will be Levi. And the Hebrew writer is trying to get us to understand that we, we, are, we respect the silence of God. The silence of God didn't say Judah will be okay. You had to change the law. And that was the point of the Hebrew writer. You're not under the law of Moses, you Hebrews who are Christians. Don't go back under it. You've got a better law. You've got a better hope. You've got a better promise. You've got a better sacrifice. You've got a better priest. And it's Jesus Christ. New Testament. And what we learn is that we don't presume for God's silence. It doesn't prove anything. But what he says does. And what is silent, we don't presume to say, I think you'll be okay, because God didn't say don't do it. We don't reason that way. We're 30,000 feet above this thing. And already we know, as we look down, we see that evidence coming from the Word of God. I'm going to kind of change that terminology. He didn't say not to, so you can do it. Don't be presumptuous. You reverence God. His Word says, don't take advantage of my of my silence, thinking that uh, it's okay. It's okay. As we look overall from a kind of a high up point, we kind of look at how is that word going to communicate God's will to me? And as we did last week, we just stayed in the book of Hebrews. Because that was how he's going to distinguish between the law that he had given to the Jews and said it's better to be under this one. And what he used was how God had expressed himself, <laughs> expressed command. The Levites were commanded to take tithes from the people. That was a command. So a Levite knew he could take those tithes. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13 and verse 7, consider them that had rule over you, meaning the elders and how they lived, how they died, maybe because they were martyred, and then seeing the issue of their faith, imitate their faith, seeing how they left their life or their life left them, imitate their faith. There's an example. It's approved. And so we realize 
He sets forth his will that way through examples that are approved. And then there's necessary inference. We all recognize a will. And he uses that illustration of Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 to say we're under a New Testament. Because a will does not avail itself until there be a death. And we find earlier in that chapter where Jesus died. And therefore a testament, a new testament is in place. But that came by necessary inference. You've got a will. You know what's necessarily inferred? You're not dead yet, so it's not, avail it's not availing anything. But when you die, it goes into effect. Now we'll, this morning kind of hone in, let's get a little lower, and let's get looking at the commands. And I want us to see how we approach applying God's commands and understanding the command part from the, from the scriptures. And I'll just give it in a chart form where we can look at God's word and realize sometimes, as we get a little closer, those commands are generic, and sometimes they are specific. And it helps us guide us in how we're going to apply those commands. Let me just start with God communicating to man. We go to the very first of the Bible in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and we observe that God is communicating with man and says, of every tree in the garden you can eat. Which one? Every tree. Apple, cherry, every tree would be okay, wouldn't it? You can eat of that. He commands that. But he also commanded, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He specified something, didn't he? He specified a particular tree. Generally, all was permissible. But in that moment of communicating to man God's will, he didn't want him to eat of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted him to, to stay where he didn't have that knowledge and sin would enter in the world, just follow me. <laughs> These are trees, you're going to enjoy it, but you can't you stay away from that. So there's a command that's around, where, where it's just, I'm communicating, every tree, you need, not this one. That's specific. In that command, there's generics, and there's the specifics about it. So when we come to seeing how the world, the, the word of God uh, unfolds, we come to the ark. And in Genesis 6, 14, Noah built the ark as he was commanded. He did everything he was commanded of, of him to do, verse 22. And one of the things was that he would make the ark out of gopher wood. Now, if he had said, make the, make the ark out of wood, Generic. You pick any kind of wood, just like cherry, apple today, what, what tree do I want? But he didn't say that, did he? That command was specific. He make it out of gopher wood. Oh, it had other things. The length of the, of, the, of the ark, three stories high, wind up in a certain place, all those things. And at the end, he, see, he did what God commanded. He did all that God commanded him, by the way. God commanded, and he was specific about the type of wood. That's before the law of Moses. Now we come to the law of Moses in Numbers, the 19th chapter. And for ceremonial cleansing for the people, there would be times when they would touch a dead body. They would touch a grave. They would touch a bones of, 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 of a carcass. And they were ceremonially unclean. God provided for the priest to have a sacrifice. They would take that blood and sprinkle the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, seven times, and then take that ashes of, of this uh, cow, and they would burn that and use those ashes to mix with the water, and that will be a water of impurity for the people. It's interesting to read, well, that's clear enough. But no, we, we, get it, we get on those things and say, you know what? What happens when you run out of ashes? In modern Judaism, they argue over, well, you still had to mix it with the stuff that was still there so we could keep the timeline going. Something magical about 
the ashes. That's where man goes. God didn't specify that problem, didn't deal with that problem. He was silent about it, didn't authorize it, didn't contend it. But I know they were to be used. And if they ran out, they knew how to start it again. But it wasn't just a cow, was it? It was a red heifer. That was specific. It's to be without blemish, without spot. And preacher, you got that etc. here. Does that mean that you could have had one that's had the yoke upon? No, he specified that too, didn't he? That he was that cow was never to be under the yoke. Specific connected with that command. If he just said, just take any animal, just take an animal, kill it, use its blood, burn it, offer sacrifice, that would become it. He didn't say that. He communicated his command. He could have done it in general, but he didn't. He specified that. And when we come to Hebrews 9 and verse 13, the ashes of a heifer. Didn't say it's red. Just the ashes of a heifer. But we know people under that law, it would be a reddish brown, red heifer. They had them. It's showing that there could have been generic, but he made that specific. Praising to God. We did that this morning. We've done that. Getting to realize that as God, as we get closer down on the Bible, realize what did he specify what was involved in that? And we read in Ephesians 5.18, we're not to be under the influence of wine where people get drunk, but we're to have the Holy Spirit affecting us. And we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing. As we admonish one another, we're singing. Speaking words is part of this singing. Now, if he just said, just make music. I just want you to make music in our worship services. Or when we are together. Because Ephesians 5 says, we're doing something together. Speaking to one another. We're not doing something private. We're together. And in their gatherings, they'll be together just like we are. And we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs as we, we sing praises un, unto God. And we sing with the heart. We make the melody with the heart. It's a spiritual worship we give. And he commands that. So he didn't just say make music. He was specific in the kind of music. We're speaking words, not making sounds. We're speaking words and we're singing praise to God as we teach one another what those words meant. And if you follow the singing this morning, they have a story. They have a point. They have a scriptural application. And we've been exercising that in praise unto God. We're let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, Colossians 3, 16. That we're, we're involved in singing, admonishing one another. And singing with grace in our hearts to God. A lot of things compacted there, but what I'm looking at, he could have just said music. There are different kinds of music, but he said sing. And if we're going to reference God, we're going to have to look, well, the authority of the scriptures and what do the scriptures do? How do they guide me in fulfilling his commands? And we're just seeing various aspects of things. What about evangelization? Evangelizing, seeking the souls of people. We're to be involved in that. He said, well, the church can do that. He said, just the church be involved in that. But in 1 Timothy 3.15, we see how men ought to behave themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. In that context, it's eldership. That elders had to have certain qualifications. But it's how we behave in the church of God. Well, what are we doing as a collectivity of God's, God's people. What we begin to see is that as he writes to the different churches, there was a local church in Thessalonica. He would write to another church in the Philippi, comprised of saints, and begin to realize, did evangelism come from the church? Was the church involved in evangelism? Well, our preacher is, but are we as a church 
collective. We're, we're preaching that as a collectivity through our contributions. We're sending that out on the internet. But we need to be teaching our friends and neighbors around us, encouraging them to come to the salvation that's found in the Bible. Begin to realize that indeed it was the local churches, as Paul says, that your faith has spread outward from you to Macedonia and Achaia. And wherever your faith has been presented, they were, they were spreading the news as a congregation. Philippians 1 and verse 5, Paul talks about the joy and the fellowship that he had in the furtherance of the gospel through those people. And we learn in chapter 4 and verse 15 when the gospel began, they were the only church having fellowship with him. He was the idea of receiving from them as they would give in order to spread the gospel. All of a sudden we see it's not just church in general. We begin to realize by example we see it's the church, the local churches involved in that. That's we begin to realize it was a local church responsibility of how we behave in the local church. We talk about benevolence, helping the poor. And we saw last Sunday that we realized that the poor that takes from the money of the treasure of the treasury of the church was to help saints. He specified that. But here in this passage, he specifies you Christians, you indeed, you, you that have widows that need their, your help. You take care of your widows, like in your family. So the church will not be saddled with that responsibility to help them. Now he gets very specific about benevolence, doesn't he? And I'm a member of this church. I'm a member of God's, of God's people. I need to take care of my own. Because I have the ability to do that. So the church will not be saddled with that. So they can take care, church, they can take care, the local church there, where we find ourselves a member, though they can take care of widows indeed which are Christians that have nobody to help them in the context of 1 Timothy 5. We're seeing directions. We reverence God. Here's something that an individual is, must do that the church is not to do. Take care of my responsibilities. But it is involved in helping those who are needy. In that context, the widow, that would be an assistance to the church as well as they are going to be used by, by the church and helping and providing for them. They're going to be serving in that capacity of helping in the local church like we find in Romans 16.1. So we see benevolence and how, of giving. All these things that we're involved in as a church, we find commands can be generic or specific. Go get me a dog. I want to get a dog. Well, is that specific or generic? Well, it's specific because I don't want a cat. Well, you didn't say not to. Well, I'm not God, so I'm not going to zap you with fire. <laughs> but don't pursue my silence. I want a dog. And I have explained to you why I don't want a cat. I just want a dog. And you, you bring me a pit bull. Uh, it might be a little problem for me, but I'm okay. I love him, her. Bring me a beagle. Now, he's cute, but he's... Uh, bring me a poodle. You can bring all sorts of dogs and you would fulfill that command. But if I said I, I want a specific dog, you would reverence me by making sure I get that dog. Commands are generic. Commands are specific. That's the way we live. Now, we may not have the rules. Don't presume anything from my silence. We just may be difficult to deal with. God said that because he wants us to abide in what he says, not add to it. So we come with commands, but we get a little deeper and realize they can be generic and they can be specific. And that's not to complicate your life. That's just part of communication. And when he specifies something, we don't go general and say, well, I can do it any way I want to. No, he specified it. And that's the only way, that's the only specific he made. So that becomes law to us. What about essentials and expediencies? Essentials are necessary in maybe carrying out the command. 
But expediencies are things that God says may be profitable to use that he hasn't specified either way. And we may choose what is expedient. That's a part of commands that we look at. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28 and verses 18 through 20, where Jesus is giving the great commission to his apostles. And at the end of that, we're to be teaching. As we make disciples, we're to be teaching them all the things that Christ has taught. And I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Teach them. Well, what's essential to that? Teach them English. Teach them Spanish. Teach them a foreign language. That's something that you possibly need to be doing. No. You're to be teaching, making disciples, followers of Christ. You're going to be teaching. I tell you, what's essential? You're going to be teaching the gospel. But how will I teach the gospel? He didn't say. He gave a generic command. And what's essential, though, is the, the gospel. You preach the gospel. You preach the word. And so he said, well, could that be in a Bible class form? Maybe in someone's home or privately here at the building? I'd still be teaching, wouldn't it? That's, I'd still be covering the essential. But we could do it publicly like we're doing right now. This is an expedient way to preach and teach the Word of God. And it should become something that, well, we, we, can, we, can, we can do these. We're still preaching the gospel, aren't we? I think it's easy for us to see that. Baptize. You make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you do that. It's because the authority of God, and you're bringing them into the authority of the Godhead. As Christians, following his son. But baptized means immersion. And it's, we find it's immersion in water. That's going to be the essential. Can I do it in the Adrian Sea? Can I do it in the Gulf of Mexico? That's water. There's immersion. Can I do it in the Trinity River? Oh, God forbid. We want something better than that, don't we? Maybe it's all we got. Sometimes the Red River is rolling pretty good. What about a pond? Set that out on my land, and I know cows drink out of that, and there may be a mosque or two out there, but I think we can shake them off. Let's get baptized. But that would be all right. It's water, or we could have a swimming pool. I like the chlorine better. Go that route. Maybe that's available. Is that okay? He didn't. That's an expediency. It may be all that we have. We, I, in, in, the, in Colonus, in that area, we just had a seat. And before the next year I went, we, we had bathhouses. And we could baptize in. Sometime in the sea, sometime in the bathhouse. But we baptize and realize that's the essential. It's being immersed in water. What? To hinder me to be baptized. Here is water. And the eunuch was baptized. We have a command to assemble. I want you to read it because I want you to realize that God wants his people to not ever turn their back upon this. It's not me just saying you get a bit, need to be here all, your, all the services. But you want to be because it says you're not to be forsaking, not forsaking our own assembling, the activity. It's it not forsaking the assembly. It's the assembling. And the reason he says that is because we're looking at a context where he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope that it waver not, for he is faithful that promise, and let us consider one another to love and provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking our own assembly. We're considering one another. We're, let, we're holding fast to our hope together by assembling and worshiping and studying God's word together. That's why we're to assemble. That's why we're not to turn our backs upon the activity of assembling with brethren. And that happens every one of our services. But you know why that could be an expediency? Maybe not 9 o'clock, but maybe 10 o'clock. We could have our Bible classes and worship service start from there. 
Maybe we're going to have one service. It'll be 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Every local church, it'd still be assembling, wouldn't it? And there will have to be a place. We're going to be assembling. This is how I get invited sometimes. We're, we're going to be assembling, but they never tell you where the party's going to be. What does that mean? <laughs> we really, we're going to invite you, but we're not going to tell you where it's going to be because we really don't want you there. Example, not reality. Hey, you want a place. At what hour? At what place? And that could be all sorts of places. It's an expediency, but here we realize that we can choose those, but we realize we're going to have to have a place in an hour, but what is essential is that it's the first day of the week. That's when we come together to break bread. And that's what he's, that's the week that he has given us. The expediency, you pick the hour and you pick the place. But we're going to assemble. That's the key. That's the command. Don't forsake it. And we talk about the Lord's Supper. Chapter 11, 23 through 27 is God's word. It's God's words on it. And the essential elements was unleavened bread. It wasn't Miss Baird's bread. I kind of like a different type of bread today. And it's the fruit of the vine. Not wine. <laughs> Remember in, the, in Lubbock, Texas, as assisting a man in a debate? And he only had a radio program, so a lot of times people questioned him, and he'd invite everybody in for debate. That's, I don't know what, what good judgment that is. But this particular day and that night, we were sitting up there, and this man came in, and going, they're going to deal with the Lord's Supper. And a man came in with Miss Baird's bread and a bottle of wine. And his children brought him forth. He said, well, what's going to happen? <laughs> and he got up and, and saw, talked about the fact of the Lord's Supper. What's the Lord's Supper? It's, it's, it's comprised of the loaf. The child holds up Miss Baird's bread. That's a loaf of bread, isn't it? It's a loaf. And then the wine came out because he said it's wine. <laughs> Well, he missed it. It's the fruit of the vine. Doesn't have to be alcoholic. Probably judgment not to get everybody drunk. So we can see. Without having drunken state about it. Ephesians 5.18. But it was unleavened bread. Oh, there's a lot of history behind that. But that's what it was in the New Testament. And those were the essentials. It wasn't peach cobbler and mashed potatoes and steak. He specified those elements. And, but having a table, did we add anything to that? It's just expedient way to contain it or we could use it and, and, and we distributed that. It has containers. Fruit of Vine has individual containers. Did we add anything to the essential elements of the Lord's Supper? No. But the command was, that we're to observe the Lord's Supper, but there may be expediencies involved to carry that out. And we see that's the nature of command. We look at what's essential and what is an expedient. When we talk about the Lord's Supper, well, they, it, my example, they, they met in the upper room. And we know from the text that it was three stories up. It was instituted in the upper room. Which one was it? Second floor or third floor? Don't know. But both of them are upper rooms. First Corinthians doesn't mention anything about a room other than they were gathered together and you got homes to eat in. You're gathering together. It was a place, but that was an essential element of the partaking of the Lord's Supper. The day was. The elements are. And so we reason with those things in the confines of what is commanded, what is essential. To carrying out that command. A place. A structure. But we never know what the essentials were because he didn't name it every place. It's just a place they come together that's opposite from their homes. We know that much. So essentials and expediencies are involved in there. And then aids and additions. We know now we're to sing. 
That's a command. Oh, where's the authority for the psalm book? I don't have specific commands for the psalm book. But we used a book today. Used PowerPoint. I know we just put the numbers instead of the song, but it's still PowerPoint. Sometimes our song leaders will blow the first note. That's not a chord. It's not having instrumental music. So we could all orderly start the song together is what the motive is. And so we get to the pitch. Those are all aids. They didn't change singing. But when you add instrumental music to it, you've got now a different kind of music. He didn't say make music. You've added a different, I've added something that's not commanded in God's word. He spoke nothing about that being in, in, in the worship service. I don't presume his silence. I'm going to do what he says, and we're going to sing. Anybody violate their conscience? Because we sing without an instrument? It's kind of strange today. Everybody else does it. Why don't you? This is why. It's reverencing God of what he said. We don't add something new to it because it fits our ear. We do it because he gave that once and for all. And we can sing the newest songs that are scriptural, and we have, and we've got a supplement book. There's no authority for that. Yes, there's authority for that to fulfill the command because it's an aid. It's not an addition. Baptize. This is not a pond. It's not the sea. It's not a river. Well, I want to make it a river. Well, we'll turn the faucet on and have running water, okay? It's called a baptistry. It contains water, the essential element. And we can immerse you in this baptistry and fulfill the command to baptize. And that baptistry is just simply an aid to facilitate the actual command there's no authority for it. It's connected with the commandment to baptize. But sprinkling is another kind of action. It's not immersion. It's what man has added to the definition in Webster's about our, what, bab, what baptizing is. Because men have practiced it. It becomes our culture. And people assume that. But baptism was never sprinkling. It was never pouring. There were other Greek words for those. It was immersion, immersion in water. And then assembling to break bread on the Lord's Supper, it'll necessitate a place so we may have a building. Is it rented or bought? I don't, that doesn't make it's not immaterial, isn't it? It's a building. And we have lights. Sometimes we worship at night or supper is served on Sunday night. We have seats. To facilitate people sitting. There could be other things that are, are involved in the uh, assembly. That it's just an aid. What if you have to go to the bathroom? We got a bathroom. Well, you got to have some water. We got a we got a drinking fountain. Well, those are not authorized. They facilitate the idea of what is involved in assembling, which we must do. And then we have to be together for the Lord's Supper. I know what we had. Why don't we want to take that on a Thursday night? We'll call it Monday, Thursday. We'll wash your feet, too. That's what religious people do when they think about Easter and think about the Passover and all of those things. Celebrating unto God. Where's the authority for that? But we know first day of the week. So we add another day that God has not said that's part of that. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But it was Sunday, the first day of the week. And then finally, we have the commandment to preach the gospel. Well, that can be something, preach the gospel. How are we going to do that? We may do it with a podcast or like we're doing with our website. They have videos on there. 
We even have little short videos. We might call that a podcast, but it's, uh, it's really not just a video on a certain question. Not interviewing anybody, that, that type of thing. But we have, we, modernity has come, modern times. We've got podcasts. You can do that. How the radio, television, or literature. All of those are aids because that's a way of communicating the gospel. But we read that the local church was involved in doing that. And when you have another organization where elders of one church is going to oversee this work of all the other churches, and you begin to have another, or, another organization besides the local church, that's an addition to preaching the gospel. That's not an aid. Because now you've got another type of organization. You've got elders seeing the work over a bunch of churches when he's supposed to tend the flock which is among you. And men have violated that. And it's called division. But we don't go beyond that which is written. We can have unity. But we also realize in commandments there are aids to facilitate that. And then there are additions. They say, well, that's an aid. No, it's an addition. It's a different type of thing altogether. So I wanted us to take a look at that this morning. To realize that there are specific commands that are specific and they're general. There are expediencies, and there's the things that it's essential. And there's aids, and there's additions. You say, well, that got me down in the weeds. I liked it back up there, but come back up with me. We get now overseeing. Now, you saw the very grassroots. Maybe you call those the weeds, a little detail. Why are you having all those divisions? We can have unity. You know how? Because in every one of the things that we practice, from our worship to our work as a church of why we're here. You may be visiting and wondering, where do I want to go to church? You can come to this congregation and know that we're starting from only what God has commanded us and what the local church was to be doing and under the authority of God when the inspired apostles revealed the word to us. And you may not know a lot of things, but I would encourage you to go to a church that honors the Bible, that you got down in the very weeds of commands and came back up realizing I want to reverence God in my life and this might be a place to come and I'll learn what you have authorized in your Bible and we're going to stay away from things that God has not done so. I think that would be a good beginning. You found the right place to come to relationship with God and I want to encourage you to do that. Our, our brethren, we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind a new generation. How are we going to approach the Bible? How are we going to be approaching this in 10 years, 15 years? We're going to kind of go away from the things of God? No, we stay there. And we'll be exactly the church that God wanted us to be. If you need to obey the gospel, you need to, to, to speak to us, you may be a, a child of God and you've fallen away, we're here to help you get back in relationship with God. Come as we stand and as we sing.